places, to Haiti as well. These were, in, in my mind, major naval bases that were used by some kind of some empire of the Pacific. Even Japan is right. part of this. Right, right. And you had what were called the ancient sun kings. They, the ancient sun kings were existed all over the world. They were in Egypt, like Akhenaten and Nefertiti, Tutankhamun. And Tutankhamun, by the way, does have, you don't really see this that much. They don't mention it that much very often when they take x-rays and stuff of him, but he's a conehead. He has also this elongated cranium, he's like weird... we're talking about the Olmecs and stuff like that. He's yeah. one of those guys, too. Statues that were in his tomb uh, show him with this weird long head. He also had all these boomerangs in mm. his tomb. Mm-hmm. He, the Egyptians hunted with boomerangs. Tutankhamun was, he was a boomerang nut. He had an entire <laughs> trunk of boomerangs in his tomb. They're on display in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo now. Hmm. And in fact, they put an Australian boomerang up there too. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Boomerangs are kind of a curious thing because we think of them as some Australian thing. Indeed. Uh, that, you know, Australian aboriginals had boomerangs. Right. But boomerangs were used all over the world. They were used by Egyptians. They were used here in uh, America. Hmm. And in fact, uh, the Hopi Indians of uh, Arizona, uh, other Pueblo Indians who lived in Texas, New Mexico, all through the Southwest, they hunted with boomerangs. Hmm. If you go to certain museums in the United States, uh, in the Southwest, you will see boomerangs on display. Boomerangs have been found in Denmark. They've been found in Poland. Literally around the world, um, and it, and it's thought, in fact, that it was the Egyptians who really spread the use of of boomerangs. Really, oh, that's very interesting. And uh, so this is perhaps a another little bit of a, a little hint or a little bit of evidence to suggest that uh, again this idea of uh, of the you know diffusion that this is a, a global seafaring. Uh, people that had communications uh, between each other, or even that they were part of the, the one and the same culture, right? Well, right, and uh, uh, some kind of a global culture. In my book on Mr. of the Olmecs, that's one of the things I talk about, how when you look at statues of of the various Olmecs, they're made out of basalt, out of granite, some are just ceramic uh, statues and pottery. The people who are depicted in Olmec statues appear to be from all over the world. They look like Africans. Um, and that's the famous colossal heads of the Olmecs. That, yeah, they look like they're from uh, Nigeria or something like that. Mm-hmm. They look very African. But other Olmecs look very Chinese. I mean, they, and they don't look African at all or Native American. They have extremely oriental features. I mean, if you showed it... If you showed one of these Olmec statues to somebody and without telling him, you know, where it was from or something, he'd think it was from China. Right. Other Olmecs, though, look exactly like Native Americans, much like the, the Mayans uh, looked for Native American. Mm. And on top of all that, other Olmecs actually look like Mediterraneans. They had thick beards and mustaches, and they looked like they were Romans or Phoenicians or Greeks or something like that. Hmm. They don't look African or Chinese or Native American. So you have there in ancient Mexico some kind of melting pot of people from all over the world, apparently. I mean, that's how it looks. Very much like America is today. You walk down the street in America, you'll you see people from all over the world: China, Africa, uh, Europe, yeah. Native Americans, and uh, you know they're they're all Americans, and that's how the Olmecs were too. Hmm. So how did all those people get to to Mexico to be the Olmecs? They probably came in boats, really, and uh, the the Olmec area was like this Panama Canal of its time. Now, some of those people would have left the Pacific areas of, of Mexico and perhaps gone to Easter Island and then to Tahiti and then to Tonga and then back to Southeast Asia. Right. Now, you know, I was just uh, I was recently in uh, Vietnam. There's this island off of Da Nang in central Vietnam, and the the people, this mysterious people, created. They lived on this island. Was their base? They created some cities on the mainland. They were called the Cam or Kham, C-H-A-M, or K-A-M. And Kham was the yeah. ancient uh, yeah. word for Egypt. And these people were thought were, were said to be uh, very dark 
dark-skinned. Mm-hmm. Um, even though they lived in Vietnam, they were thought of as, as African-type people. Mm-hmm. Well, Egypt, which was named Qom in ancient times, Indeed. and even today, the Arabic name for Egypt is Qomet. So these people, uh, Egypt is in Africa. And many of the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, they were basically black Africans. Mm. And they're showing up in Vietnam. These people, the Qom, also, they went across the Pacific. And they used this one island base. So you, you, you have even some evidence there that Southeast Asia, Angkor Wat, and Cambodia, right. um, uh, even Indonesia and, and whatnot, it, it's left there. If you look at Bali, the, in Indonesia, which is the most popular tourist spot in all of Indonesia, mm-hmm. it's unique because that island is still a Hindu island. The rest of it, Indonesia today is the largest Muslim country in the world. Really? And most of the islands in Indonesia are, are Muslims, mm-hmm. but not Bali. It is still a Hindu island, and that... I mean, basically, all of Indonesia in ancient times was Hindu. And later, places like uh, Thailand became Buddhist as a reform on Hindu religion. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Hinduism, apparently in ancient times, went all the way out into the Pacific, through Indonesia, past New Guinea and all these islands, and then to Tonga, Tahiti, and to the Americas. How Mm -hmm. about that? Very interesting, and you know, I want to ask you what what you think. I mean, many people are talking about the fact that that a, an ancient global civilization existed, but that something happened, and, and many people entertain the idea that because of some kind of catastrophe, uh, whatever it now happened to, you know, what it was, we can speculate on that. But um, is that an idea that that you entertain and have have found evidence for at all? Well, certainly, and. I mean, one of one of the things that I say along those lines is that there's been many catastrophes. It's kind of one of the problems with looking for Atlantis, and almost all my books are somehow about Atlantis in in one way or another. But for many archaeologists and modern Atlantis hunters, they they think, oh well. I need to find some island civilization. Uh, it was destroyed in some catastrophe. So they start looking around, and sure enough, uh, just the, one of the first islands they come to shows evidence of some catastrophe. Mm. And they think, well, I found Atlantis. And, um, and the problem with that is, I mean, people have found Atlantis all over the world, including Indonesia. Uh, Atlantis has been put in South America. Uh, the Azores, it's, it's been put in Sweden, even. How about that? There we go. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the, the problem here is that there's been many cataclysms. Just yesterday, we had a big earthquake here in the Midwest of mm-hmm. America. Indeed, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, no one was, was hurt, although people were woken up out of their pets. Um, buildings uh, did, you know, part little corners of buildings, you know, fell off and stuff like that. Mm. Fortunately, no one was hurt. But earthquakes, cataclysms, tsunamis, uh, volcanoes going off, uh, and, and uh, many, many cataclysms are are local and isolated to certain areas. Although other cataclysms are are devastate wide ranges of, of the world. Volcanoes going off can do that. When you look at that uh, tsunami of a couple of years ago in the Indian Ocean, that, that I mean, that actually affected many, many nations, you know, on different sides of oceans. Mm, yeah, indeed. Uh, almost a quarter of a million people got swept away in that one. That's that's pretty huge, you know. Yes, right. So, I mean, how, I mean, people, of course, are still talking about uh, that catastrophe today. Yeah, sure. But in, it, there must have been many, many catastrophes like that. And areas like, particularly island areas in Indonesia, Indonesia is probably one of the most vulnerable countries in the world mm. to this kind of thing. Krakatoa blowing up in late 1800s. You, you've got other tsunamis. You, you've, people often, particularly in island areas, they, they live near the shore and there's, I mean, statistically, there's the idea that there's some big tidal waves eventually going to hit their island and wipe people out. This, this happens in, in Indonesia all the time. Mm. 
Mm. It's one of the legends in Australia, and that the Australian Aboriginals have is what they call the last wave. Um, they, they made a movie of this 20 years ago. Yeah, Peter Weir. Same yeah. title, last wave. But it, that's yeah. they are the the Aboriginals are claiming that yeah, one day this giant wave is going to hit Eastern Australia. Mm. And literally just wipe it out. And it, I mean, it could happen tomorrow, or maybe it won't be for another hundred years. We don't know. Right, right. Um, David, one one last uh, question here for you before we uh, finish off this second segment here. And, and um, I, I just want to ask you, considering that you've been to to so many different places around the world, and really kind of also uh, looking for many things that that uh, you know interest me and a lot of people that are listening to this program. Uh, that has to do with with ancient uh, structures, megalithics, and things like this. If you could pick just a few of these sites uh, ar- around the world that really stands out in your mind, uh, or uh, I guess your kind of favorite places, uh, could you share those with, with us? Well, Easter Island would definitely be one of them. Tonga is another good one in the Pacific. You have the fantastic utterly incredible city of, of Nan Madal on, on Pompeii Island in Micronesia. That mm-hmm. that city is 11 square miles of over 100 artificial islands of 150 million tons of basalt stacked up into artificial islands and walls. Hmm. We'll have to talk about that sometime. That also is a couple of chapters in my book on lost cities of ancient Lemuria in the Pacific. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, going to to Peru, Tiwanaku, uh, the Olmec areas of Mexico, seeing what's in Egypt, going to Baalbek in, in Lebanon, that's the largest cut stone blocks in, in the world. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. You've, you've got other areas, even um, Aksum and uh, Ethiopia. I, I'm personally fascinated by obelisks and the uh, unusual things like that, which are giant monolithic granite crystal towers that weigh their way 100 tons or more. Yeah. Just exactly why or people would, would make obelisks and erect them. They, they Egyptologists still haven't figured that one out. That's right. That's um, right. You, don't, you hardly ever hear about obelisks, really, because it's they, archaeologists don't know what to say about them. There's, there's, hard, there's very few books. There's maybe five books have ever been written. We, about we, obelisks. That's right, and we uh, just... I, I wrote one of them, and uh, it just, you know, they they cannot figure those things out, yet they are gigantic megaliths that are, you know, very cut needles and, and erected. Yeah. Even um, modern countries, uh, Italy, French, uh, British, and Americans, you know, they all become obsessed with obelisks, and went to Egypt to bring obelisks back to their own countries and erect them in, you know, various parks and things like that. That's right. That's right. So there's Oh, there's many places to go and, and new things to find too. And one of the interesting things too is that many of these giant cities today are underwater. And that's I mean you would almost you'd have to go in a submarine. You they're too deep probably to 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 go actually scuba diving. Right. Some of right. These sites. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to find here on planet Earth. It's, uh, there's many, many mysteries, and the more you travel and see these places, the more amazed you are, and, and then you, you find out about even other places that are very obscure, and uh, that things to discover. I, that's why I like Indiana Jones movies, the whole, <laughs> the whole idea that there's new things to find out, that we're only beginning to really scratch the surface of the mysteries of the past. Uh, I'm a big believer in that. Absolutely. Me too, and I totally agree. And that's why it's so fascinating having you on, David, because you're always a guy who's out there and you have have your finger on the pulse, so to speak. So, uh, again, thank you very much for for coming on the program today and sharing some of your uh, stories with us. But, but again, mention um, a few of your your books that you have out there and uh, what website people need to uh, take a look at. Well, right. Uh, the new book that's coming out is called The Crystal Skulls, and uh, my book that came out last year was The Mystery of the Old Max, and I, I write 